So we have a few uh, terrific prizes to give to terrific people. And I'll begin with the Henry Allen Moe Prize, which is awarded annually for the best paper in the humanities or jurisprudence that's been read at a meeting, a meeting here at the APS. And Elizabeth Cropper, chair of the Henry Allen Moe Prize Selection Committee, will present this year's award. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Just down. The American Philosophical Society is pleased to award the 2020 Henry Allen Moe Prize in the Humanities to David S. Tatel in recognition of his paper, Separation of Powers and Statutory Interpretation, A Battle Hidden in Plain Sight, read at the American Philosophical Society's 2019 April meeting and published in its proceedings. David S. Tatel is the senior United States Circuit Judge at the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Of the separation of powers, James Madison wrote in Federalist 47 that, quote, no political truth is certainly of greater intrinsic value or is stamped with the authority of more enlightened patrons of liberty, end quote. With this constitutional principle instilled in every citizen from childhood, Judge David S. Tatel opens his elegant paper, Separation of Powers and Statutory Interpretation, A Battle Hidden in Plain Sight. Declining political debate, Tatel guides the reader succinctly through the arcane thicket of statutory interpretation. Unpacking the significance of the 1984 Supreme Court Chevron decision, more often cited than understood, Tatel explains that it is not the decision itself which is of the greatest importance, although he does explain its impact, but rather the way that the, quote, Chevron two-step has brought about the passage of decision-making power, in effect, lawmaking powers, to a vast range of federal government agencies. Scrupulously avoiding interpretive partiality, Judge Tatel presents a model argument that is clear, logical, and compelling. He expresses some real concern that this transfer of power has considerably expanded the regulatory powers of new parts of the government well beyond anything envisaged by the framers of the Constitution. Such concern has been expressed in several Supreme Court decisions, summarized here by Judge Tatel, but these have not yet amounted to a redress of the balance of authority among Congress, the courts, and the agencies. This deft and plain-spoken yet subtle essay instructs the citizen reader on the often hidden prolonged constitutional debate over the extent to which important and regular aspects of the lives of Americans are governed not by the executive branch, directly at least, by their elected representatives or even by the courts. Hidden in plain sight in Judge Tatel's words, is the continuing struggle, quote, to keep our three branches of government separate and distinct. On behalf of the Moe Prize Committee, it's my great pleasure to present the Henry Allen Moe Prize to Judge Tatel. Thank you. When I began writing my 2018 talk, Separation of Powers and Statutory Interpretation, a Battle Hidden in Plain Sight, I wondered whether anyone other than a handful of administrative law mavens would really be interested in a speech about, yes, statutory interpretation. Well, it turns out that I had nothing to worry about. The American Philosophical Society Interested as it is in everything interesting, not only seems to have liked my talk, but has awarded me this lovely prize. <laughs> so thank you, Elizabeth, and the other members of the Mo Prize Committee, Michael McCormick and Brent Shaw. And it's a special honor to be included 
in the company of the extraordinary individuals who have also received the Mo Prize, including my friends Kathleen Hall Jamison, Larry Tribe, and my dear late colleague, Judge Patricia Wall. In my talk, I focused on what is called the major questions doctrine, which holds that for a subset of especially important issues, it's the courts, not administrative agencies, that interpret the governing statutes. I warned that if that doctrine ever became law, it would shift massive amounts of power from administrative agencies to the courts. We judges would then decide, among other things, what pollution limits are necessary to protect the public health, which security regulations are necessary for the protection of investors, and how to regulate the internet. Well, the major questions doctrine is now the law of the land. In an opinion written by Chief Justice Roberts, West Virginia against the Environmental Protection Agency, the Supreme Court held that EPA has no authority to interpret a provision of the Clean Air Act because the regulation at issue designed to shift the nation's power grid from fossil fuels to renewables was one of significant economic and political magnitude. Economic and political magnitude. Those are the court's words. Ironically, in Dobbs, the abortion decision issued just days earlier, the Chief Justice had cautioned against, quote, decisions that jolt the legal system. West Virginia is not a jolt. It's an earthquake. And only time will tell where it falls on the Richter scale. But two things are now for certain. The battle is no longer hidden in plain sight, and no one has any doubt that the decision poses a serious threat to the many federal agencies responsible for preserving the environment and for protecting human health and safety. And don't take just my word for it. Justice Elena Kagan, APS 2016, said this in the last two sentences of her powerful and utterly persuasive dissent. Today, the court appoints itself instead of Congress and the expert agency, the decision maker on climate policy. I cannot think, she concluded, of many things more frightening. I agree, and thank you for this lovely award. <laughs> I hope people realize what an amazing talk we just heard. Um, I would give Judge Tatel another Henry Allen Moe Prize just <laughs> on the basis of that. <clears throat> wow. Okay. The Jacques Barson Prize in Cultural History was established in 1993 by a former student of Professor Barson's. The prize is awarded annually to an author whose book exhibits distinguished work in American or European cultural history. Michael Wood, chair of the prize selection committee, will present the 2022 Jacques Barson Prize. Thanks, Nora. So for a minute, I didn't have the script, but I do. Uh, the uh, the Jacques, uh, hang on, this yes. Uh, the Jacques, the 2022 
Jacques Bazin Prize in Cultural History is awarded to Elizabeth D. Samet in recognition of her book, Looking for the Good War, subtitle American Amnesia and the Violent Pursuit of Happiness. Dr. Samet has been a professor of English at West Point, uh, United States Military Academy since 1997. I, qu I quote her from the book. Miraculously, she says, with some irony, the deadliest conflict in human history became something inherently virtuous. I continue at the end of quote, uh, but to say what she says, we turned the damage and the loss of, Second World, of the Second World War into a scene of rescue, an American saving of the face of democracy and kindness. Another quote, each generation has found a new use for the good war. Uh, it is seen as, uh, end of quote, it is seen, uh, the, the good war that is, World War II, is seen as the only one of its kind, the war that all others fail to be. Without wishing to deny the heroism of many soldiers or the horrors committed by their enemies, Samet asks us to attend to a more complex view of the long historical situation. In this spirit, she explores, the story, explores stories of the good war in all kinds of places, in political campaigns, in history books, in TV series, in movies, in guidebooks, in comics, in memorial speeches, and much else. Uh, what she suggests is that the myth of World War II excuses other more questionable combats, so that, I quote again, we allow our guilt to obscure the realities of devastating indecisive wars and thereby, quote, increase the likelihood of finding ourselves in a similar predicament once again. Samad is particularly persuasive uh, on the topic of lateness, both in wartime and after. There are wonderful instances of just how slow we were to get to the place we thought was correct all the time. Like, uh, think of things like, like uh, uh, premature, what, premature anti-communism, premature anti-capitalism, -what whatever it is. Um, uh, Questions like, the book asks questions like, which ardent defenders of democracy were paying attention when Italy took over Ethiopia, for example, or when the civil war broke out in Spain? And even in England, after, after the Munich Agreement, there was still a very strong will to do nothing at all until the very last minute. Looking for the Good War is a defense of history in the fullest sense a model examination of one of our most dangerous habits, replacing accounts of what happened with flattering posthumous fables. Even when the fables are partially true, as I think this one is, it's usually worth taking another look at them. It is my great pleasure to present the Jacques Bazin Prize in Cultural History to Elizabeth Samet. Thank you all very much. This is a wonderful honor of which I'm deeply appreciative. I consider myself most fortunate to have found such open and generous readers in Michael Wood, Robert Pippin, and David Hollinger. And I thank them and all of you, the American Philosophical Society. There is a line in one of Jacques Barzin's essays that goes some way toward explaining what I discovered while writing Looking for the Good War. Culture has continuity, Barzin writes. It lives on as other kinds of facts do not. Writing, as I did, about the unmooring of our cultural memory of the war from those other kinds of facts presented all the anticipated challenges, chief among them a tenacious, almost sacred devotion on the part of so many to the good war myth. But my greatest difficulty was unlooked for. And it consisted of revising the dedication of this book in memory rather than in honor of my father. World War II was his war. He was, to borrow Abraham Lincoln's description of the Revolutionary War generation he watched fade away, it's living history for me. I found in him what Lincoln found in those veterans, a fortress of strength. Lucky enough to survive his war, but falling, falling finally, again in Lincoln's matchless phrase, 
to the silent artillery of time. The great happiness, therefore, that I feel in receiving this award is tempered only by my disappointment that my father did not live to read this book, to argue with me about it, and to share this day with me. Thank you very much. The Patrick Sufis Prize was established and funded in 2006 by Patrick Sufis, a member of the Society for 22 years until his death in 2014. The Patrick Sufis Prize honors accomplishments in three very different and deeply significant scholarly fields that, re that reflect the spectacular scope of his own interests. The prize rotates each year between philosophy, psychology, and the history of science. This year, there are two recipients for the Patrick Soupes Prize in the Philosophy of Science. Nancy Cartwright, Chair of the Selection Committee, will present this year's awards. The 2022 Patrick Soupes Prize in Philosophy of Science is presented to two equally deserving recipients. Craig Callender, in recognition of his book, What Makes Time Special, and Sabina Leonelli, in recognition of her book, Data-Centric Biology, a Philosophical Study. I'll begin with Leonelli. Sabina Leonelli's book, Data-Centric Biology, recognizes the ways in which the abilities to accumulate, preserve, and distribute massive amounts of data are changing so many scientific fields. This groundbreaking study attends to the philosophical issues raised by this important trend. Focusing on biology, Leonelli shows how big data modifies orthodox ideas about experiment and theory, and she addresses the new philosophical questions it raises. The Soupy's Prize Committee sees data-centric biology as a pioneering book that opens up a major new era, area of science for philosophical discussion. The possibility of amassing and storing huge amounts of data invites researchers to perform exploratory experiments and shifts emphasis from theory construction to practical goals. When data become broadly shared, new norms arise. Withholding data is, for instance, sinful. As Leonelli shows, the concept of data evolves. Data are relative to goals since they must be stored, packaged, to aid particular research questions. This requires a new style of scientific work. Databases require curating to enable investigators around the globe to find information potentially relevant to their projects. Leonelli explores the challenges facing those who assume this novel role. <coughs> Sorry. As she notes, one of the few previous philosophers to take an interest in the production of data was Patrick Soupies himself. Her rich account may be seen as the flowering of a seed that he once planted. The committee regards her book not as the last word on its topic, but as one that will inspire and shape an important subfield in the philosophy of science. On behalf of the Soupies Prize Committee, it is my great pleasure to present the Patrick Soupies Prize for pioneering work in philosophy of science to Dr. Sabina Leonelli. I think we've heard a lot already today about the importance of truth, and I am immensely honored um, to stand here today, have the possibility to meet you, and to be um, at the meeting of this society who has done a lot to defend that very idea, and to be awarded um, this prize, which really recognizes a lineage of work, which brings together the humanities, the sciences in reflecting on how actually, what is the role of science in this research for um, empirically established truth, and how does science sit in a much wider, um, kind of very complex world. And so I think um, you know, I'm extremely grateful 
that this prize is relating to the name of Patrick Soupis, who indeed has been uh, for a long time um, somebody that I, whose work I looked up to, um, but also um, to the um, prize committee for this prize, Nancy Cartwright, uh, Lauren Duston, Philip Kitcher, and Steven Stiegler, not least because they have done also enormous work in advancing understanding of what it means to really think about scientific practices and relate them to their much wider um, um, social and uh, political context. So I very much thank them and the society for this. I'll now turn to Craig Callender. Uh, Craig Callender's book, What Makes Time Special, is an ambitious and original exploration of the question in the title. And it involves an important in-depth account of the understanding of time in both contemporary physics and contemporary psychology. So it spans uh, quite a lot. Uh, it addresses a fundamental challenge to physics claim to tell us what the physical universe is really like. Physics does not seem able to accommodate time as we encounter it in everyday life with its special sense of now, the asymmetry of past and future, and our sense of the flow of time. Yet it seems pure scientific hubris then to dismiss our experience of time as chimerical on account of our favorite theories in physics. The book provides a masterful survey of the role of time in Newtonian gravitation, relativity theory, quantum mechanics, and quantum gravity, concluding that none find an easy place for time as we know it, with relativity and quantum gravity positively inimical to it. Then the book deploys insights from biology, cognitive science, and psychology to construct a brilliant reconciliation. Our model of time, as we experience it, is forged by our minds to deal with the perceptual and evolutionary problems thrown at it. Time can be, can be, uh, time can be as physics portrays, but we misrepresent it for very good reason. This way of saving both views at once is well grounded in the science and is compellingly argued. The Soupy's Prize Committee congratulates this book for opening serious new inroads on a classic problem that philosophy has long struggled with. On behalf of the Soupy's Prize Committee, it's my great pleasure to present the Patrick Soupy's Prize for pioneering work in philosophy of science to Dr. Craig Callender. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, thank you to the uh, Soupy's Prize Committee for doing that. Um, I know there are many deserving books, and I know it's a lot of work, and so I thank you all. Uh, thank you also to the APS for supporting the prize. There aren't that many prizes in philosophy, so it's especially nice to, to earn one, um, especially for this person who is a native Rhode Islander who grew up catching fish behind Gilbert Stewart's uh, uh, birthplace uh, and this, in front of this uh, portrait uh, from Gilbert Stewart. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm obsessed with time. Uh, I always have been. And I think of it as one of life's, you know, one of the great mysteries up there with consciousness. And so um, if there's anything of merit in the book, it really comes, I think, from, you know, uh, looking at my own field, which I thought was kind of spinning its wheels for a while and coming to that realization about 20 years ago, and then looking around at other fields and being able to draw on you know, many different disciplines. And so having this opportunity to look at different disciplines you know, can sometimes help answer these kind of, or at least make headway on some of these big problems, even ones that have been uh, around for a couple thousand years. Um, one perspective I did not draw on, though, uh, was what did Benjamin Franklin say about time? Uh, it turns out that Benjamin Franklin said a lot about time, a lot. He was very kind of, especially about time management. He was kind of, I, one would not say bossy and kind of preachy when it came to time management. Uh, so one thing he said was that one today is worth two tomorrows. There I have to disagree because, well, today is yesterday's tomorrow, and I think it's, 
Um, but another thing he said, which is far more famous, is he said time is money. Now, I certainly didn't set out 20 years ago to write a book on time for money, but I do have to say, in this case, he is spot on. Uh, so <laughs> thank you very much. Dr. Judson DeLand, a prominent Philadelphia physician and outstanding figure in medical research, <coughs> left the bulk of his estate to the APS in the 1930s as an endowment to be used to support research in clinical medicine. The prize recognizes outstanding achievement in clinical investigation, particularly patient-oriented research. Clyde Barker, chair of the selection committee, will present this prize. The recipient of the 2021 Judson DeLand Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Patient-Oriented Clinical Investigation is Sergio P. Pasca. In recognition of his work pioneering novel approaches to investigate neuropsychiatric disorders by creating self-organizing STEM-based models of the human brain these including functional human circuits in a preparation he calls assembloids. He creatively applied these models to uncover mechanisms of neuropsychiatric disorders and identify therapeutic agents. Sergio Pasca seeks to understand the rules that govern the assembly of the human brain and the molecular mechanisms that lead to psychiatric disease. His models have allowed him to map genetic variants associated with schizophrenia and autism onto human forebrain development and to identify susceptible time points and cell types. Taken together, these novel tools and discoveries made by Dr. Pasca are giving access for the first time to unique cellular aspects of human brain development and function in deciphering the molecular mechanisms of disease. This is terrific stuff, terrific science. Some of you may have noticed the feature article in the Inquirer, Philadelphia Inquirer several weeks ago calling attention to this as a possible prelude to the transplantation approach um, of, these, of these devices and, and organisms. Dr. Pasca is the Kenneth T. Norris, Jr. Professor of Psychiatry, the U. Tensko U. Family Director of the Stanford Brain Organogenesis Program, the CZI Ben Barnes Investigator, the CZ Biohub Investigator, and a whole host of other titles. I'm pleased to present the Judson DeLand Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Patient-Oriented Clinical Investigation to Dr. Sergio P. Pasca. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, I'm so deeply honored and thrilled to be with you today and to receive this award. Um, I grew up in a small town in Transylvania during the last years of communism in Romania, where my scientific heroes were on one side Emil Palade, who discovered the ribosomes, and on the other side, the dictator's wife, who overnight became obsessed with chemistry and became the preeminent scientist of the country for almost 20 years. So as you can imagine, <laughs> I, I'm deeply honored to join this incredible list of uh, prize winners um, of the Yuton Dalland Award. I'm interested in understanding the human brain and what makes the human brain unique and perhaps what makes it uniquely susceptible to psychiatric disease. 
And of course, the biggest challenge that we've been facing is that the human brain is to a large extent inaccessible. It's inaccessible at the molecular and cellular level in a way that would allow us to probe, to manipulate, and really understand these conditions. That's why I often joke that I suffer from an oncology envy syndrome. Because we just see how, what incredible advances have been made in oncology over the past few decades. And the reality that is that in psychiatry, we're still diagnosing conditions the way we were doing in the 19th century. We're treating them the way we were doing in the mid 20th century. And so that's the reason why over the past 12 years or so, my lab has been striving to build human models of the human brain uh, outside of the human body that allows us to understand what are some of the mechanisms uh, that lead to psychiatric uh, disease. And my dream, of course, remains that of building a molecular psychiatry, which I think it's still uh, just in the beginning. But I think, again, to cite Benjamin Franklin, um, well done is better than well said, he said at one point. <laughs> so I'd rather stop making promises and assure you that we and the hundreds of labs now around the world that are using these techniques are hard at work trying to understand and cure these devastating conditions. Thank you so much. The Carl Spencer Lashley Award was established in 1957 by a gift from Dr. Lashley, a member of the society and a distinguished neuroscientist and neuropsychologist. His entire scientific life, life was spent in the study of behavior and its neural basis. Lashley's famous experiments on the brain mechanisms of learning, memory, and intelligence <coughs> helped inaugurate the modern era. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the modern era of integrative neuroscience, and the Lashley Award recognizes innovative work that continues exploration in this field. Bill Newsom, chair of the Lashley, Sele Lashley Award Selection Committee, will present the award. The 2022 recipient of the Carl Spencer Lashley Award is Nicholas Spitzer. Atkinson Family Chair, Distinguished Professor at the University of California in San Diego, in recognition of his discovery of neurotransmitter switching in single neurons of adult mammals, and his demonstration of causal links between neurotransmitter switching and behavioral state. And don't panic, I'm gonna explain what that means, okay? <laughs> For roughly 60 years, our field has been governed by Henry Dale's principles. Uh, of our understanding of the chemical character of the synaptic connections between nerve cells in the brain. Dale postulated and marshaled a lot of evidence that the palette of transmitter molecules released by each of the brain's 80 billion neurons was immutable like a fingerprint through life. Nick Spitzer provoked a sea change in this conception of neural identity by discovering neuro neurotransmitter switching in adult animals. The switches in neurotransmitter expression occurring in response to sustained environmental stress uh, or stimuli were massive. These are not small effects. Excitatory transmitters could be replaced by inhibitory transmitters or vice versa. And remarkably, the postsynaptic receptor molecules that bind to the neurotransmitters change to match the new presynaptic transmitter. And importantly, these were not simple laboratory curiosities. In really elegant experiments, Nick showed that transmitter switches are linked to changes in behavioral state of the animal, playing a critical regulating role in behaviors as diverse as motor skill learning, uh, regulating circadian behavior, and behavioral expressions of fear. Due to Nick's corpus of work, Neurotransmitter switching is now regarded as a novel and important form of neuroplasticity that may lie at the root of numerous long-term behavioral changes. And in addition to being one of the best neuroscientists of his generation, Nick also sports the best mustache in the field, <laughs> as you will see as he accepts this famous APS award. It is my great pleasure to present the 2022 Carl Spencer Lashley Award to Dr. Nick Spitzer.
I'm uh, deeply grateful to the uh, American Philosophical Society for this award. It is a great honor. I, uh, I know very well the long list of uh, my colleagues who have won this award in the past. It's, it's a panoply of the, of, the, of the great in neuroscience. I first learned about Carl Lashley's uh, important scientific contributions when I was an undergraduate at Harvard. In 1963, I took a course, a physiological psychology course, that described uh, his work. I was very impressed by that. Around that time, Professor John Dowling, a member of the APS, um, although not at that time, I believe, had taken me into his lab. Um, I was interested in doing experimental work. He set me up with an electrophysiological system to record activity from the uh, eye of the horseshoe crab, Limulus polyphemus, and it was transformative for me. Uh, it was at that point, uh, through that amazing experience, that I uh, had determined my career uh, to be a, uh, a, a neuroscientist. I, I thank this bill and the selection committee for selecting me for this award. I also want to recognize and acknowledge my many graduate students, postdoctoral fellows who have contributed importantly to the work for which I'm being recognized. And I'm very grateful to my wife, sitting here in the third row, uh, who has been uh, graciously very supportive of uh, the long hours and the uh, travel uh, over many years uh, in pursuit of this work. As Bill mentioned, uh, uh, this form of brain plasticity, this change in the brain in response to experience, uh, is uh, fairly profound. I believe there are many other forms of plasticity in the brain that remain to be discovered. Uh, the brain is, a, as we know, rather remarkable place, uh, and it uh, constantly changes to keep up with everything that we experience in our environment. Thank you again very much. So we've come, to our, we've come to our last award, and when we've finished this proceeding, please stay in your seats. <clears throat> oh, no, don't stay in your seats. Leave your seats? What? Could people hear Annie without the mic? OK, so the concert has been canceled. The council meeting will take place as scheduled in uh, Philosophical Hall. And uh, this will conclude the program. But uh, all these awards are a big deal, but the Magellanic Premium Award is a really big deal. In 1786, two years after his election to the APS, John Hyacinth de Magellan of London made a gift to the APS of 200 guineas for a medal to be awarded, quote, to the author of the best discovery or most useful invention relating to navigation, astronomy, or natural philosophy, parenthesis, mere natural history only accepted, and parenthesis, end quote. <clears throat> the medal, named the Magellanic Premium, was first awarded in 1790. It is the oldest medal recognizing scientific achievements given by a North American institution. And Dr. Gordon Bame, chair of the Magellanic Premium Selection Committee, will present this year's medal to somebody who you have just seen. The 2021 Magellanic Premium Medal is awarded to Sarah Seeger in recognition of her work on atmospheres and interiors of planets outside our solar system, planets known as exoplanets. Professor Seeger was the deputy director of science for NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, by its initials, which to date has discovered 66 new exoplanets, all close enough to Earth to be imaged and searched for signatures of life. Her current research focuses on the biosignatures 
in the atmospheres of potential life-bearing planets, including Venus, as we just heard, that could be used to discover evidence for extraterrestrial life. Well, the, the question of whether there is life on other planets or are we alone in the universe has perplexed humanity since the time of Epicurus, some three centuries BCE. Both Ke Galileo and Kepler asked the question. And now, as we heard in our talk on Venus, Sarah Seeger is carrying out the fundamental science to give us an answer. Her early work was found foundational, including the first predictions of the properties of the atmospheres of exoplanets and the development of transmission spectroscopy, leading to the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere, to mention just two examples. Thanks to her and others, over 5,000 planets have been discovered to date around stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And of these, nearly 200 are potentially habitable. Focusing on discovering Earth-like planets and through analyzing their atmospheres, for life-supporting elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphine, sulfur, sulfuric acid, not, and hydrogen, she's poised to tell us which could be habitable. The medal is engraved Sarah Seeger for theoretical work that led to the first detection of exoplanets. It gives me great pleasure to present the Magellanic Premium Medal to her. So it's true that since ancient times, people have looked up at the night sky and wondered what is out there, what lies beyond Earth. And it's simply just humbling to think about our daily trials and tribulations as confronted by the vastness of the universe. And while since the ancient Greeks have wondered even about planets out there, how common are they, do any of them have life on them, it's true that today we're the very first generation that get to do the real search. And we'll find signs of life if either you know, aliens send us a signal, or Venus or Mars or other bodies in the solar system, or by looking at atmospheres for gases that don't belong. And I am really proud that my method will be the first to be used to try this on a handful of planets with the newly launched and operational James Webb Space Telescope. Back in the mid-1990s when I started working on exoplanets, I was a graduate student at Harvard, and my advisor, my PhD advisor, Dimitar Sasolov, I was his first student, and he hadn't realized you're not supposed to give a student a very, very, very risky project. Because at the time, exoplanets were newly discovered. And people didn't know if the field was going to go anywhere. They didn't even believe they were really planets, instead thinking it was different, weird things going on with the host star itself. So I'd like to thank all of those who believed in exoplanets. I'd like to thank all the people who have big dreams and know how to reach those who support other people's big dreams. And I'd like to thank my wonderful husband, Charles, and all of the spouses, partners, and families who continue to support us so we can do great things. Thank you. <laughs>